On this edition of Independent Sources, Fair Pay, Brooklyn cooperatives emerge as a growing sector for immigrant businesswomen. The Yes Men, holding multinational companies accountable through parodied ad campaigns. And Mama's Home Cooking, a Korean-American entrepreneur turns his mom's recipe into a business. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Diana Ravinka. And I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. The Center for Family Life in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, has come up with an innovative way of protecting immigrant workers' rights. They've been helping their members start and run workers' cooperatives, where the members are all part owners of the business. The Center is a neighborhood based social services organization with deep roots in Sunset Park, an area that has a high population of recently arrived Latino immigrants. The cooperative's organizers created the program as a means of helping its members get fair pay. A study from the New York Immigration Coalition showed that more than one-fifth of immigrant workers were paid less than the minimum wage. So far, a number of these worker co-ops have been a great success. I talked about some of the program's successes and some of the struggles with the cooperative coordinator, Vanessa Bransberg. Vanessa, tell us how your organization has come up with uh, this initiative for worker, immigrant worker co-ops. Yeah, so um, where I work at the Center for Family Life, which is a program of SCO Family of Services, uh, we started researching um, how to develop a model um, to, d to help people uh, create worker-owned co-ops back in June of 2006. Um, and we basically reached out to some centers in California where they'd already been working with immigrants to develop co-ops as well as here in Long Island and around New York City. And at that point we realized that um, we could also start uh, working with people in the community to help them uh, develop their own cooperatives. How often do you see uh, these worker co-ops in New York City? Um, you don't see them quite often. Uh, we've been um, doing this work now for about six years and we've seen that over the last, I would say, two to three years, there's been um, an increase of interest of com um, from community-based organizations who are really looking to think about ways to um, create work and good work uh, for people um, in immigrant communities other than just uh, placing them in jobs. Uh, so there's been, there's been an interest, um, but there aren't other co-op development centers um, in the New York City that are working specifically with immigrants. Tell us exactly how these um, uh, co-ops work. Uh, so basically, um, worker-owned co-ops specifically are, uh, you know, run by the people in the co-op, and they also um, do the work themselves. And so they have one vote, uh, each person, for every decision that's made. And we, as a con their consultants, help them to develop the structure of the business. So we provide a 12-week training where we help them sort of develop uh, the business plan, the marketing, um, you know, their identity as a business. And then after that period, then they start working together. Um, to, to basically continue to develop that structure until they're ready to launch about 8 to 12 months after they, they uh, join. Who are the, the, the members? Uh, they're, they're immigrants and uh, most times they're illegal immigrants. Uh, at the same time, you don't ask the status. Elaborate a little bit on, on, on that, who they are and their mm -hmm. status. Yeah, so uh, the members of the co-ops that we've been working with um, are all immigrants. Um, they happen to be all women in the three cooperatives that we're working with now, Si Se Puede, Beyond Care, and Golden Steps. Um, most people are from Latin America, uh, mostly Mexico. Um, we, don't, we don't ask for their status. It's not a requirement um, to develop the cooperatives. Um, but we do know that they have had experiences where they have been underpaid and haven't been able to negotiate terms of work with their employers. And so they were looking for other ways to create um, you know, work that would be sustainable and they would be able to develop collectively with the other co-op members. How do they get paid? Uh, so the CISA Puede and Beyond Care Child Care Cooperative, uh, they basically get paid directly by their clients. Um, so they're members of the cooperatives, uh, but they work independently and directly with their clients, either doing babysitting or cleaning in their homes. Um, and then they pay a membership due to their co-ops um, to sustain the business expenses. 
you just said that uh, a lot of uh, the members uh, have been women and they happened to be women. Can you talk more about that and why are there not more men involved in the co-ops? Mm -hmm. Well, with these particular co-ops that I mentioned, the cleaning cooperative, the child care, and then there's a new one called Golden Steps um, that's providing non-medical companionship care for the elderly. Um, you know, I think uh, the people that have uh, tended to come to, to create these co-ops have been women because traditionally these have been, this has been work that women have done. However, um, you know, we don't intentionally only work with women. Uh, men are, are certainly welcome to join the co-ops. And in the past, we have worked with men uh, in, with other co-ops, um, mostly around construction. Um, and so there have been a, a few businesses that we've worked with um, that have decided not to continue as co-ops. Um, but in the future, we're certainly open to working, you know, men, women, whoever uh, that are interested in developing worker-owned co-ops. Some of the co-ops that you've just mentioned have been successful and uh, others, like the, the construction one, uh, have, uh, have not been able to, to continue. What made those uh, particular co-ops fail? Well, I think that the the two cooperatives um, that d decided not to continue to to work together as a co-op um, were mainly because of the industry that they um, that they were in. Um, one of them, like I mentioned, was called We Can Fix It, and they were doing handiwork um, construction, and that was a very difficult market to break into. There was a lot of competition and needed to really get certain licenses that were very difficult to get. Um, also, just to break into it and compete with other really big construction companies. Um, um, just they weren't able to make that. Um, and the other one was called Color Me, and it was a group of women actually who were doing interior painting. And just as well, just like the construction one, um, there was also an industry that was very difficult to kind of um, make it happen because a lot of people either paint their own apartments or um, they're competing with larger companies that have a lot of capacity. Um, so, so that's what we saw. Um, however, we do know that many businesses fail, um, and that's pretty typical. So we're very proud of, of these other co-ops that are, have been doing really well. You are working with community-based organizations to attract immigrants who are interested in the uh, cooperatives, and you're providing uh, cons uh, con consulting to, to these uh, organizations. How are the organizations uh, uh, advertising this within the immigrant communities, mm -hmm. do you know? Yeah, so we're basically two, doing two different things right now. We're working directly with the community members, as I mentioned, with these with these co-ops um, in Sunset Park. And then, as you mentioned, we're also right now starting to provide consultation directly to community-based organizations in different parts of New York City who want to develop uh, co-ops themselves. And so basically, it's like train the trainers um, process, where we um, have started to do um, trainings for these uh, CBOs um, who um, would like to learn the steps of how to start with recruiting people, how to do an open house, and how to provide um, that 12-week training so that they can learn um, how to develop the business structure. And then for them to develop their own identity as a con consultant, uh, which is a separate um, you know, sort of uh, service than just doing um, social services for the, those people in the community, but rather you know, working um, uh, you know, independently um, doing that work. You've been receiving uh, considerable support from the City Council. You've uh, obtained a, a $150,000 uh, grant. Tell us about that. Yeah, so we are extremely excited to um, basically uh, be recognized by the City Council um, uh, and the model that we've been using. So um, they were really interested in us um, doing the work that I just mentioned, which is to basically identify two community-based organizations in areas that are not in Sunset Park um, to assist these two community-based organizations to basically help them launch uh, a co-op development center or program. And uh, so we just started doing this um, in September, uh, and we did four intensive trainings with representatives from those two community-based organizations um, to get them to start thinking about the principles of cooperation, what their role is um, as a co-op developer, uh, what the history is of co-ops um, here in the United States and abroad, and then starting to think about wait, what co-ops or industries they might um, help to develop with the community members of the neighborhoods where they come from. Vanessa Brandsburg, thank you for being in studio with us today. Thank you. Still to come on the show, holding big business accountable when no one else will. Before that, Abby Shola has some other news. Thanks, Vianora. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic and community media.
Voices of New York reports that increasing gentrification is negatively impacting longtime residents and business owners in South Slope, Brooklyn. After the city passed new zoning laws for the area back in 2005, developers came in, causing rents to spike. Many Latinos have moved out as a result, and longtime residents who remain say they are forced to travel outside of the neighborhood to buy cheaper groceries. From color lines, 30 undocumented immigrants, ages 10 to 32, are telling their stories in a new book. Graham Street Productions published Papers, Stories by Undocumented Youth. The book comprises of letters the company received while producing a documentary with the same title. The company published the book to give young undocumented people a voice. A group of African-American Harlem architects hoping to put their stamp on Columbia's new $6.3 billion campus say the university shut them out. DNAinfo.com reports that the group, Arch 527, has worked with top architecture firms and designed multi-million dollar projects, yet Columbia only granted them a menial project for its new West Harlem expansion. Columbia, which was required to sign an agreement that includes affirmative action requirements, denies the claim that they were shut out based on race. And finally, Voices of New York is taking a look at Ecuadorians in New York who are preserving their culture through dance. Members of the city's fourth largest Latino group say their traditions are in danger of being lost. To address the issue, Ecuador native Jose Rivera founded the Ayazamana Culture Center, where students learn traditional folklore dances from different parts of the South American country. Those were just a few headlines from the ethnic and community media. Back to Gary and Vianora. Thanks, Abby. The Yes Men are a group of media-savvy activists challenging corporations to do the right thing. They use a number of different tactics, including press conferences and parodied ad campaigns that sometimes push the envelope and their targets to make a change. Judith Escalona filed this report on the group who has battled international companies such as Chevron and mocked the New York City Police Department. New York University's Hemispheric Institute of Politics and Performance is home to the Yes Men. The team works with community groups to plan actions against unfair business practices and government policies. An example of one that was very uh, well seen was uh, where we impersonated Dow Chemical and went on BBC World Television on the 20th anniversary of the Bhopal catastrophe, which is the largest industrial accident in history. And we announced that Dow Chemical was finally, after 20 years, going to compensate the victims and pay to clean up the plant site. And today, I'm very, very happy to announce that for the first time, Dow is accepting full responsibility for the Bhopal catastrophe. That intervention was about creating a space in which people could imagine an alternate reality where a company could actually do the right thing. Breaking news right now, the Chamber of Commerce saying it will reverse its position on the climate change bill. What we need is simply a carbon tax. For 12 years, the founders and main performers, Andrew Bitzelbaum and Michael Bonanno, have been challenging corporate giants on their own public relations turf. They issue press releases, build websites, produce videos, and stage press conferences that mimic the mannerisms and speak of big business, but present policies that stand them on their corporate heads. You have to realize that the entire public relations industry is a massive con. I mean, most of what we get in advertising and, I mean, television news, you know, a good third of it, especially most local news, uh, is advertising that's masquerading as news. Impersonating the captains of industry or launching bogus corporate campaigns might seem like risky business. The Yes Men and other activists who engage in what's come to be called culture jamming actually welcome legal actions. We want them to attack us because when they do, it gives us power. We don't have any power. They have power. They have power and money. And if they attack us, we get a voice. These things are supposed to make you fearful but if you indulge the fear, if you act upon the paranoia, then you're in a sense defeated. If you're afraid of being sued or afraid of something like the Securities and Exchange Commission acting against you for engaging in your right to free speech, then they've won. So 
can't, can't go there. You end up self-policing. In New York, the Yes Men have conducted campaigns or actions through their Yes Lab, a program that works directly with community groups to address their concerns. Mary Notari heads the Yes Lab. A recent campaign, Three Strikes You're In, challenged New York City's stop and frisk program. We came up with an idea that we would pose as a partnership of McDonald's and the NYPD. Every time you are stopped, frisked, and released, simply fill out your name, ethnicity, date and time of stop, and the office This partnership back. would be to stop. grant coupons and vouchers for free Happy Meals. The Cold Cares campaign caused children's books and magazine publisher Scholastic Inc. to review its policy towards industry-sponsored works and to stop the publication of a coal industry-sponsored book for children. The action also drew attention to new findings linking coal burning to childhood asthma. And the campaign was to provide free or very inexpensive themed inhalers that made asthma cool. So. The idea is that instead of treating asthma, you treat the stigma of having asthma. So a child wouldn't feel embarrassed anymore to pull out their inhaler. In fact, they become the coolest kid because they had the Elmo inhaler or they had the Justin Bieber inhaler. In 2010, the Yes Men released a film about their exploits titled, The Yes Men Fix the World. They recently ran a successful fundraising effort on Kickstarter to complete a second film. The Yes Men are revolting. That film will help launch the action switchboard that will allow activists and community groups to network and share resources. I'm Judith Escalona, Independent Sources. Try us at home, kids. It's fun. You can learn more about the Yes Men by visiting their website, theyesmen.org. There's more ahead on the show when we come back, turning Mama's home cooking into a viable business. Thanks for staying tuned. Leonor, is there any food you had in Romania that you simply can't find here? Yes, there is. With all the products that the Romanian specialty stores are, are selling, there's one thing that you cannot find, and that's the, the black cherry bitter cherry preserve. Uh, that's a staple of the Romanian cuisine that every family makes every fall, and they store it by, by the dozens of the jars to last throughout the next year, and it's delicious. You cannot find it here. Well, you're not alone. One Brooklyn entrepreneur is bringing a slice of home to America. He started his company, Mama O, making kimchi, the Korean staple, because he couldn't find any that excited his taste buds. One could say that Kadim O stumbled onto his newfound profession, or that he's a natural born entrepreneur. But to the native Marylander, what he does is simple. I'm a, a kimchi maker. I make kimchi and kimchi's Korean hot pepper pickled cabbage. I started making it because I got a craving for it. And back then, uh, there, there were no artisanal kimchi companies. Everything was from uh, like a, a large uh, food conglomerate. And it would either be gross, syrupy, sweet, full of MSG or all of the above. So I asked my mom to teach me how to make it. So with no business skills, but a whole lot of passion, the former musician and DJ stopped spinning records and launched his company out of his home kitchen four years ago. 
He now spends hours at his 900 square foot shop in Williamsburg, missing ingredients and stuffing jars of kimchi for distribution at upscale supermarkets such as Whole Foods and Zabar. So uh, it was a chance meeting with my butcher, uh, Jeffrey's in Essex Market, and I was buying some ribs to make a, a Korean barbecue. And he says to me, oh, you eat kimchi with some, uh, you, eat, you eat those ribs with some kimchi and rice, you're eating like a king. And like in my mind, I'm thinking, who are you telling 50-year-old Jewish guy with a ponytail? And, uh, and so I asked him, do you like kimchi? He's like, yeah, I love it. I was like, okay, well, uh, I make this stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll bring some by. And I brought some by, checked up on it a week later, asked him what he thought. He said, I love it. And so I said to him, well, you know, I make this stuff. I sell this stuff. And he said, I want to start carrying it. Mama Owens is one of hundreds of small businesses being subsidized by the city under various programs that help entrepreneurs like Kadeem grow their business and increase market share. NYC EDC, they held a, um, a food conference that was for s small uh, food manufacturers. And everyone th that was there, you, you, can, you got to meet different uh, uh, distributors, um, different people uh, that could possibly help you. And um, they also, uh, there's a, it was a contest to uh, win entry into the, the, the fancy food show, the NASFT fancy food show. While Kadeem would not talk about his revenue, he said that sales are expected to reach into the six figures for the first time at the end of 2012. For Independent Sources, I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. Finally from us tonight, we wanted to leave you with a taste of the holiday season. Coquito is the drink of choice at this time of the year if you're Latino. It's also known as Puerto Rican eggnog and has some ingredients in common with that American drink. Its origins are in Spain, where an egg punch was carried to the colonies and went through several forms throughout Latin America. In Puerto Rico, rum replaced the wine and sherry, and coconut milk and cream were added. In New York, there's a yearly competition to see whose coquito is the best on the block. We take a look at how these sultans of spirits make their brew. It's great, Coquito. It's wonderful. Sabroso. I, I, I love it. It was great. I love it. Oh, it's good. And I've had a lot of Coquito over the years, and this is good. Coquito is eggnog Puerto Rican style. So essentially, uh, eggnog contains eggs and milk uh, and cinnamon and other good ingredients. Uh, in traditional uh, United States uh, and other places, it may be with uh, whiskey or uh, bourbon or probably vodka. But in Coquito, we make it with coconut is a, is a difference and with rum. In the years I've been uh, making Coquito, I know that there, that there are different family recipes and there are different styles. There's some, I guess, standard ways of making it, which is with different types of milks and uh, different types of rum. I'm going to share elements of the recipe, but I really can't give you the secret formula. It's like Coca-Cola revealing what goes into Coke. We really can't do that. People at the party would taste the secret ingredient. This 
must be Angel Roman's recipe. I know it anywhere. Okay, well, the, the, the fiesta, I mean, to be crass, is essentially a marketing attempt by us. What we do is we, we ply people with coquito, and then they decide to buy our cards. One year, our coquito was so successful that we forgot to pull the cards out to sell. So that didn't work that year. But this year, we think it's going to work out. That's our show this week. As we wrap another year of the show, we'd like to thank you for tuning in. Stay with us in the new year for more stories from the city's vast ethnic and immigrant communities. Till then, be independent-minded.